So, uh, what I'm going to do is talking about uh, talk about a series of webinars that we've had uh, to better understand our monitoring efforts within Chesapeake Bank, putting them into context with a broader suite of monitoring efforts. We call this effort Basin Building and Sustaining Integrating Networks. So, first of all, we we've had two webinars. One in December, we brought in folks from Puget Sound as well as um, the Great Lakes and then in January January last month we brought in a group uh, a larger diverse group we got two Australian examples Morton Bay and the Great Barrier Reef you know the up, upper Mississippi and we have a group of, of scientists that are coordinating uh, it's called Maracuz it's the Mid-Atlantic Regional Association Coastal Ocean Observing Systems it's a long uh, acronym, but it's a, a group of uh, people with technological uh, capacity that are bringing new, new ways uh, forward for that. So I'd like to uh, talk a little bit here about uh, what one of the, the sort of the things that uh, help predicate what we're we're doing uh, in this analysis, and, and that comes from the science and technical. Uh, Advisory Committee or STAC and some of their monitoring concerns and, and, and a large part of that monitoring concern has to do with the adaptive management cycle and how monitoring fits that adaptive management cycle and provides evaluation and feedback for the various efforts that are ongoing. But it's also uh, a switch in thought uh, process. Uh, you know, we, we've talked about monitoring for attainment uh, for our water quality goals, but but the the stack is concerned that we make sure that we we talk about monitoring for adaptive management and how it act actively field feeds into adaptive management. The other uh, aspects that we've been uh, 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 you know that, that stack has been interested in is the uh, integration of citizen science and modern technology, and. The, the idea that it's an opportunity to take a broad sweep of, of, of and now look at the monitoring and not just uh, small tweaks, but, but a broad sweep. And then finally, the new Bay Agreement, which is uh, uh, within months of, of being signed, uh, should clearly articulate the goals, the strategies, uh, and, and various objectives that will lead to specific monitoring needs. So we got to make sure the monitoring connects in this adaptive management cycle to the goals and, and feeds back in that fashion. So here are the, the case studies that we've uh, solicited from uh, folks in Puget Sound uh, and Morton Bay, uh, the Upper Mississippi River, uh, the Great Lakes, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, and I put these in sort of a scale here from left to right. Uh, the scale of these, on just a crude scale, they go from about a tenth of the size of Chesapeake Bay to 20 times Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake's in the middle of that spectrum, so they're some much smaller and some much larger, but we're looking across that span of scale to, to see what kinds of of aspects uh, uh, that, that we could learn from, from from that. And we've got five questions that we posed, and I'm going to go through each of these five questions and give you my interpretation of the summary that, of, of those uh, results. The first question we asked each of the groups was, what are the network objectives for your monitoring network and, and the design? And we, I, you know, we, we kind of went through our Chesapeake objectives and design. We had the water quality monitoring, the shallow water monitoring, the benthic in fauna, the aquatic grasses, the fisheries, and the, uh, the various plankton sampling, and sort of how we went through that. And then what we learned from the case studies is that just about everybody has similar elements of water quality and then various habitat and fisheries. And so that, that was a pretty common trait. There were a couple that I thought were unique enough to pull out and highlight. One was this sewage plume mapping that uh, Simon Costanzo talked about in Morton Bay, a methodology of using stable isotopes and, and then watching that uh, shrinkage as the sewage upgrades went online uh, of that sewage plume. And then secondly, uh, an expanded monitoring that Great Barrier Reef is using for pressure state response. In other words, they're putting in a lot of effort in 
looking at what the farmers are doing on the landscape and monitoring their progress of, of achieving best practice. Uh, and so that represented a, a departure from just the state of environment reporting, which, which we've mostly concentrated on. And of course, in the Chesapeake stat uh, concept of what Chesapeake stat would do would be more of that pressure state response monitoring. The next question we asked of all the groups is describe your operations model, including innovations. We talked about the Chesapeake, that we're doing data flow and vertical profilers, engaging citizen science. We've got regular but still qualitative remote sensing, highly evolved reporting with report cards and statting, barometers. And then the case studies, we heard that just about everybody has uh, achieved these technical capacity through various agencies. That there's a sort of a professional cadre of, of people involved in monitoring programs that are delivering that science. There's citizen science are engaged across the board, but to different levels and in different manners. So each group has got some component of citizen science. Some of the groups, like the, the Puget Sound, had a very uh, and they call it their vital signs wheel, a very uh, evolved uh, and, and well presented um, set of metrics that they connect across a broad range of, of they've got healthy human populations, water quality, uh, restoring habitat, um, water quantity. So, you know, a broad range of, of, of indicators. And then uh, in Morton Bay, they had a, a fresh water. Uh, to complement the marine monitoring with uh, a reporting network uh, around that. So, so they give report card scores for both freshwater as well as marine. We asked them to describe their business model. And um, what we learned is that there are multiple funding sources with different mechanisms of delivery to different science providers. So in some cases it was EPA money or, or funnel to USGS or, or a variety of different ways of doing that. Um, and at the, each time we saw the partner organizations involved in this, they provided significant matching funding. And that's something uh, characteristic of the Chesapeake Bay monitoring. You leverage, for every monitoring dollar, you leverage many more dollars through the partnerships. And there's this evolution towards user pays. So. Uh, you know, the model that we had in Chesapeake Bay is the is we use EPA dollars largely to fund the, the monitoring network. And um, one of the models that we, we uh, heard about is uh, in Morton Bay where where not just the, the regional councils but, but also um, some of the industry partners, uh, the, the fertilizer company and the and the, the meat works and the cement companies. Uh, are in a user pay basis, so it's a shared uh, burden financially uh, on, on the monitoring effort. And it's connecting uh, those potential users to the monitoring results that, that is, is key. In terms of the governance models, this, this turned out to be uh, uh, really varied. A um, whole lot, everybody had some kind of org chart that, that showed uh, different pathways and different groupings. There's a little commonality that I could see between those because of the different scale for one as well as the different structures. They tend to be fairly complex. None of these monitoring programs are simple in execution. They all have complex governance arrangements. They have different jurisdictional arrangements. They have different uh, science providers, different oversight, but there was a commonality that that technical oversight and review is provided through that monitoring network. So I guess the governance model is very much uh, seen as a way to make sure, ensure the quality of the data. And that was a theme we got throughout. Everybody wanted to see that same quality of data. Now, they're not going to monitor everywhere, and so it's not data quantity. For example, the upper Mississippi, it turns out the upper Mississippi is a series of lakes and dams. It's not a free-flowing river, it's a bunch of stair uh, uh, staircase lakes and ponds. And these, these sampling, you can't even 
go to each pond and sample. There's so many, so you have to subsample there. So how do you subsample that? So you have to go through the rigor of determining how to do that effectively. So, so this monitoring effort is is clearly um, takes a lot of of organizational involvement. It's not unique to Chesapeake Bay program that you have a lot of people involved and that there's an importance to maintain the rigor throughout. And then our final question was describe your successes and challenges. And so we, uh, we had one uh, uh, that just came out a couple days ago, the New Insights report, where, where I would claim one of our bigger successes of integrating uh, lots of, of data over many years to, to tell some stories. Uh, you know, we've had the scientific basis in the Bay Program for a long time for nutrient sediment reduction strategies. We've identified and tracked major inputs and their impacts, provided feedback on overall management effectiveness. Our challenges have been, in Chesapeake, a slow, steady and slow erosion of funding support, uh, a realignment uh, of balance, rebalancing from tidal to non-tidal, and a recent major uh, funding shortfall. So that's what we provided from Chesapeake. Now, uh, what I did is I took some examples from the other case studies of some of their successes. And I think one of the most powerful successes of the Maracuse group, that's that Mid-Atlantic Regional Association, is the, the kind of partnerships that they've formed, the really solid linkages that they've made with various industry partners on, on monitoring specific uh, uh, efforts. And so uh, we, 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 we think that that's something very much worth emulating. We see some possible partnerships in the future of Chesapeake Bay monitoring of connecting with these, uh, these, these scientists that bring a lot of the technological innovation into the monitoring room. Another one uh, that I alluded to earlier is expanding the monitoring to include the management responses, figuring out ways to track quantitatively the management response and, and report that as well as the ecosystem health. And then uh, this uh, success in Morton Bay of having a sewage upgrade, uh, a series of sewage upgrades, which resulted in a significant reduction of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, flow into the bay, and the ecological response to that empowered that community to take on harder, more difficult challenges like diffuse sources. The challenges in all cases, we were looking uh, maybe naively when we started this uh, webinar series for novel solutions. Where, where are these magic pots of money that people are going to get for monitoring? How do they ma ma maintain a sustained funding effort for monitoring? The answer resoundingly was, there ain't no such thing. Monitoring is hard money to find and secure and maintain over time. It takes diligence and effort, <coughs> persistence and patience. Um, <laughs> And uh, we also heard uh, in the Morton Bay example of uh, about, uh, uh, I think, 13 years of report cards. This is report card fatigue. People get tired of the same answer or, or bad news. Uh, we've seen that in Chesapeake already, and we haven't been doing it as long. So it's something to watch out for and something we have to uh, anticipate. And then. Um, <coughs> We also saw in some of the programs that aren't as mature as Chesapeake, I'd say, is that, uh, like the Great Lakes and Upper Mississippi, where they're still selecting which indicators out of a vast cadre of indicators to really focus on and use. So I think the, uh, the Great Lakes has like 70 uh, some indicators, and they're trying to figure out which of those uh, they need to track and report. So, so that's that's clearly something that, uh, that, that, that that's a common issue among monitoring groups. So those are the, the, the kind of things that, that we saw from those, those different webinars. The other aspect is that, that we shared with all these groups is that field work is really quite expensive. There's, there were no magic associated with that either. It's, it's people, it's equipment, it's vehicles, it's boats. The data analysis is time intensive. You need you need to develop and maintain databases and do statistical analyses. And these recurring costs are subject to inflationary pressures. So, monitoring programs today uh, are going to be challenged with uh, constant dollars uh, tomorrow. 
so we, we, we use this opportunity to kind of reflect a little bit on the Chesapeake uh, efforts that we've had uh, about a quarter century of good long-term monitoring, and we've been able in that time period to identify eutrophication causes and, and impacts, particularly the dead zone, the, the so-called dead zone, the hypoxia and anoxia in the bottom waters due to nutrient enrichment and phytoplankton production and, and decomposition. We also use the monitoring data sets to detect and uh, explore the impacts of climate change. Uh, we've seen the bay, uh, Chesapeake Bay is getting warmer, it's getting saltier, it's getting deeper. Uh, the status and trends of key indicators, uh, in, in some cases, um, we've got some things that are improving. Our nutrient concentrations are improving. But, uh, you know, looking at monitoring data over time gave us this opportunity to really come into, get, bring into focus this decline in water clarity that we've seen uh, over, over the bay, uh, over the last couple decades, stimulating uh, research. A couple more highlights, uh, the ecological thresholds or tipping points have been, uh, and, and, and the ecological feedbacks that, that stimulate these tipping points has been um, both positive and negative, have been articulated. We've used this, uh, these, these monitoring data to have input to public dissemination, report cards and barometers and, and, and feed into research. And we've used it to assess our water quality for our, uh, our, our, our current management of a total man maximum daily load uh, mandate for uh, water quality improvements. Some of the convergent frameworks that we've seen across uh, a couple of these scales, these are just uh, three examples of using uh, the stoplight colors that the Great Lakes, Chesapeake Bay, and the Puget Sound are using in different kinds of format. Um, also, in an attempt to look at trends in different ways, uh, we've got trajectories mapped, uh, we've got arrows, and, and there, there, there are different ways to, to do that. But in all cases, uh, a public format, a public dissemination of that reporting format is, is common and, and, and uh, uh, in all the examples that, are, that have been developed. So, um, I, I I've got a couple things that I want to talk about. These next three slides talk about sort of why we uh, think that uh, that we need to explore these monitoring <coughs> efforts uh, more more fully. One is that we need this institutional monitoring to provide a skeletal backbone for any additional monitoring, like citizen science monitoring. Citizen science monitoring is great, but you need that skeletal background. You always are going to rely on high quality, timely, accessible data with continuity to make important management decisions. And that piecemeal data doesn't replace this integrated monitoring. We can't see this, uh, these patterns uh, effectively without this uh, institutional monitoring. And the other part of this that, that we, 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 we've, we've appreciated is that adaptive monitoring is, is part of adaptive management. We all know about the importance of adaptive management, but monitoring has to be adaptive too. So not any, it, it needs to be something that evolves, and that's one of the processes why we're initiating this, these webinars, to rethink monitoring. Citizen science cannot, can augment, but not replace entirely the institutional monitoring. So you need the coordination, the training, the personnel turnover, uh, means there are always training needed. There's the quality assurance, quality control issues. You need the continuity. And there's some difficult or dangerous locations where trained people are needed. And yet, you know, on the positive, there's tremendous untapped potential. So we see this as both a growth area with these caveats that need to be overcome to make it an effective uh, monitoring effort. And then technology. So we've got in situ technologies. Uh, We've got gliders that, that uh, fly in the, in the water. We've got uh, satellites and air, aircraft that sense remotely. Uh, we we got to remember that's not they're not free. That they, these these gadgets are very expensive. Uh, they aren't maintenance free. They require calibration uh, and op, uh, maintenance and operational cost. Some features you still need to be on site to sample, and uh, yet these 
one of the exciting things, and I think the Maracuse uh, case study was the, the best, but demonstrating that techn technological innovation provides for new partnership opportunities. So if we can use this uh, uh, effectively, we can create new opportunities for, for data acquisition. So here is my final slide that's, uh, that kind of uh, tries to bring some of these points together from, from these webinars. First of all, one of the realizations is we don't do this enough with monitoring. We have a very uh, elaborate and highly evolved scheme of, of trading research results through uh, scientific journals and conferences and workshops, but we haven't done that nearly as much for monitoring, it's apart from perhaps just the water quality bits and pieces. But, but this broader view of monitoring uh, has not had this kind of peer sharing. And so one of the things we've learned is that's, that's something that needs to, to we need to grow there. Um, uh, we also recognize that we've got to be a little more um, cognizant of, of the terminologies that we use. Monitoring and assessment mean something to a scientific community. They don't necessarily mean much to the managers. Uh, that sounds boring, it sounds hard, it doesn't sound interesting. Uh, one example we, we developed in one of the discussions in the webinars, let's not use the word monitoring, let's use the word intelligence gathering. So, so we, we, we gotta be cognizant of the fact that you're, you, you, you know, you're, you're using monitoring in a broader context to a broader audience than just scientific audience. The funding and security is common, so we're not, we're not alone, we're gonna uh, we recognize that that's going to be an ongoing uh, battle that we're just going to have to maintain uh, uh, diligence on. Uh, we also saw this uh, broad engagement. There are multiple stakeholders involved and there are different reporting mechanisms. There's no real one way of doing it. There's no particular best practice. Um, I, I, I think uh, we, we, we've got uh, uh, a very elaborate scheme in Chesapeake Bay of, of engaging various stakeholder groups, but uh, some of the ideas that we saw, like the vital sign wheel at Puget mm -hmm. Sound, that we ought to we ought to really evaluate and look at as, as potential ways to improve our uh, reporting. And I think that the overall arching theme we saw from all the case studies is the critical need to connect monitoring results to management actions, and not only is it a need, but it's a current gap. It's not something that everybody feels like they've achieved that in any real satisfactory way. Just a few places and pieces of that, but, but the fact that we really need to, to, to keep our focus on, on using monitoring to connect these results to management actions. So we're, we're, we've got in um, each of these basin uh, uh, webinars are on our Chesapeake Bay website. You can look in detail for all those different case studies that I've just glossed over in this very short overview. So I invite you to go, go look at that. We still have one more webinar uh, planned and we're gonna continue this conversation and discussion about future monitoring needs and, and, and ways to, to best serve the adaptive management of Chesapeake Bay and restore this uh, ecosystem. So I'll end it there, thank you. <laughs>